Welcome to The Whole Enchilada, a community of high achievers that fight the status quo, rebel against mediocrity, and make life happen. Let's go. Hello, Enchilada Nation. I'm super excited. A new friend of mine, David and I met a few weeks ago at a, a, an adventure course called Spartan 7, where we were actually with a, a group of incredible, about 30 individuals, entrepreneurs, and, and uh, some ex-former uh, uh, special forces, and really spent some time together. And, and I will tell you, when I went to this event, I thought it was all about the shooting and the and all the fun adventure type things we get to do. But I will tell you what I took away from that event was more on a personal, mental, spiritual level, which we're going to talk a little bit about today. And how do we accurately uh, apply intimacy to the right areas and the mm -hmm. right relationships that we take those important key relationships to the next level? David Rutherford, I'm going to turn it over to you to help kind of fill in the blanks of what I missed because I'm not going to lie. Line up my bio next to yours. I feel like I'm lacking, <laughs> lacking a little bit. It's pretty impressive. I feel the same way about you, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> so what did I miss there that you want to touch on? Give my, my listeners a, a background of what you've been up to. The, 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 I think the brilliance of your commentary about the accuracy of intimacy is so perfect. I mean, you know, I, you always, I mean, if you really want to understand the human condition, just look at the history of mythology, right? Look at all the stories that have been cultivated throughout cultures across every different continent, every different group. They're very similar. Uh, Carl Jung uh, did incredible work on all of that for, for years after he said, you know, I, I think Freud has some theories about, you know, uh, some ideas, but I, I think our subconscious is really is a derivative of the stories that we kind of are exposed to from early on, right? When we first start hearing uh, the tales from our family or the tales from friends or now, unfortunately, our children are being you know, completely inundated with, you know, the, 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 the millions of stories and sub stories and images and narratives that they're just being bombarded with. There's a detachment from that, that slow story, the story, which is your, the crucial um, personality components that makes you who you are. So yeah, we do have to have an armor to protect ourselves for sure. And depending upon how you were raised and where you were raised and what you experienced, that armor's thick or not so thick or whatever. And you certainly build it up in different places more than others, right? The, the targeted accuracy of intimacy is, is critical. Now the question becomes, right? How, how, where do we start? What is the first and most accurate place we need to start with, with what intimacy is, right? And, and, and I think that's intensely debatable. <laughs> yeah, I, it, I, think it, I think it can be. And I, and I also think it depends on the, the relationship, right? Bingo. So one of the things I'm picking up here is there isn't, it isn't intimacy. You have one level of intimacy with your spouse. You have one level of intimacy that you, you're dedicated and give to your children. You have a different level of intimacy with your coworkers, right? And that can be defined as an intimate relationship if it has specific things and it's, it's intentional, right? Mm -hmm. and so I think I, the interesting thing you just said is it's the target. And it's the same thing as if you're, if you're on the range, you start with, you don't know where you're shooting until you know what the target is. Yes. Then you start to adjust yourself to approach and engage the target, right? Yes. And both, you, you can't start engaging without knowing the target and the target by itself can't be engaged. It's, there's two sides to that equation. Well, it's funny, man. I was just a knuckle dragon medic, right? So I was, you know, they 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 put a ton of uh, 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 grenade, you know, these grenades on, you know, these little uh, uh, um, M4. I used it like an M40 and M79. I mean, and I'd have these little grenades all over my grenade. And you know, why they give that to me? Because I was a shitty shot, right? I, I didn't have good accuracy. So they're like, here, give Rut the the grenade gun, right? Let him, you know, five mile, five meter kill radius. I can, you know, shoot twenty of those. I'll clear out. 100 people and you know <laughs> very short amount of time. But then all of a sudden I start working with snipers that were in my first platoon and these really brilliant men who, who had a profound dedication, one in particular, Morgan Dawson, God rest his soul. Um, you know, Morgan had this uh, way he would describe um, uh, the, the intimacy of shooting a weapon, right? And it was about starting with, uh, you know, the device he uses, right? It, the instrument, right? 
what his trigger was like, what the barrel was like, what kind of steel it was made out of, the optics he would put on made a huge difference, but the optics and then and then what beyond that, right? What is the area of operation? Are you in the jungle? Are you in an urban city? We impose so many lit- limitations on we think because we don't feel we have enough time in our days, right? We got to get to the next thing and get to the next thing and get to the next thing. So what we do is instead of, instead of having that aim small, miss small mentality, we're sitting there just spraying all day. <laughs> right. Right. And you think about that and, and that's kind of the way it works. But this, these snipers in my life, they, they really taught me hey, there are so many variables that come into play to be accurate and and especially to be accurate at what longest shot ever, I think is some Canadian soft guy who has like a, it's like over 3000 yards or some ungodly amount of this. There's an, there's a, an English uh, SAS guy that had like a 2,900 yard shot or some in Afghanistan. I mean, these are insane distances, but, and to think about everything that goes into that reading, wind and the temperature, your bullet, your projectile, your, your ballistics, the person, how fast they're moving, that's intimacy. And so when you make that statement of targeted intimacy, right, it's really about penetration. And, and I know that's kind of phallic in nature or, or sexual in nature, but we're, we might as well run with the metaphors here, <laughs> well, that's right? right? How deep do we want to go? Do we want to go as deep as I, I know the names of your kids and your, and your spouse or your significant other and, uh, you know, and we're able to share stuff like that? Or do we go as deep as your darkest secrets that you're sharing with me because you can't bear the burden of that? Or is it just, you know, hey, a handshake and it's good to see you, good, you know, good to see you. I mean, so it's about penetration. It's about accuracy, right? That's what I, I, I that's where really I began to evolve that it, it's not this superficial thing. It's not not it's not it's 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 so much emotional right it, it, it's not uh, we're not using the practicality so much of our our cognition we're not using the the normative of our behavioralism we're digging into the emotional uh, structure of how we function in our relationship. I love where our conversation's going here because in my mind, I'm formulating, I think in checklists and processes, right? right. So in my mind, I'm thinking like, okay, uh, if I was going to, if I was going to build a procedure around this, which obviously relationships aren't procedural, but, I, I, but you can I, approach I, them in a way that you can. can absolutely. Yeah. I, I think we need frameworks. Sorry yeah. to cut you off, but I no, believe that. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And kind of the framework that I'm taking from our conversation here is it starts with, do you have an understanding of what intimacy really is? Mm-hmm. And then the second one we just identified, uh, unless you feel like there needs to be one in between, the second one we identified there is starting to compartmentalize and identify who are the who are the relationships that you do want to penetrate and on what level do you want to penetrate that intimacy, right? Yep. Because it, it, it's not a fair assumption to think it would exhaust all of us if we try to have a completely intimate relationship with every single person. We all have choices to make where we have to start deciding who is it that that I can fill and they can fill me on a deeper level. And everybody else, I can still have an element of an intimate relationship, but it's not going to be as deep of a relationship. Oh, you're, you're spot on. I mean, imagine if everybody in your life came to you with the deepest, darkest, most challenging trauma of their life for you to assist them with. And, and, you know, I I get a lot of that. I get a lot of that randomly from just online or when I meet people or I give a speech, you know, people come over afterwards and, you know, they just share the intensity of their experience with me, uh, you know, and they just, and and it's like, man, I just really, I, you said this and it triggered this. I really want to share this. And at first, man, it was so heavy. I was so ill prepared to deal with it. Uh, And then as my faith got better and as this, you know, my, my skill sets within my faith developed right and I became really I like to think of it now as I'm, I'm kind of an operator for God now right that's yeah. that's what I do now I'm a warrior for God and 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 so once I got better then I was able to maintain and understand uh, how to how to use that because I would come home and then I would bear this burden of of all this stuff and I'd bring it into my house and, and it would in, it would interfere with my relationship. It would interfere with my kids. It would interfere with my own uh, psychology, right? Uh, and then, you know, I went through a very difficult divorce, very, very difficult divorce and, and really struggled with what all that was. And, and, and it was after that, 
where I came to the realization that I wasn't genuine with myself in, in, in much of that relationship. I was chasing an identity that wasn't truly me. I was chasing, I was, I had always had this very substantial guilt. Um, you know, we go to those events, man, and you hear, uh, you know, Dan has 200 plus combat missions, right? Uh, Biss, uh, you know, uh, you know, a thousand combat missions, right? Chris, we don't even know how much shit he's done, right? Who knows? And, and, and here I am, I've got a handful, you know? And I, so I always feel this guilt, this guilt. So I, for so long, I was trying to chase an identity that was never going to be. But what I, what I didn't know as I was chasing this, I was actually uh, coming at myself from a different perspective. It wasn't the easiest route. Uh, and now that's what I try and do. I try, people have <laughs> read direct them and and none yeah. of these routes now just for your listeners none of this is easy and i never want to portray in any capacity to anybody ever that i am a master at any of this stuff that any of it was easy for me in fact it was debilitating at times but you know i knew i needed this transition and then when i met you know my my now wife and it was it was transformational because for the first time now, the partner that what I was with was redirecting and asking me the poignant questions about, well, how do you define intimacy? And I would give definitions. She'd be like, that's not how I look at it. And I'd be like, what do you mean? Well, and then you get this completely different perspective, somebody you're all in with, but yet they're sharing with you and it goes completely in a, in a, in a whole different direction that you've been contemplating. And now you're like, whoa, I just expanded this definition through the relationship. So when you start to recognize that the investment is not just about sharing your thoughts or beliefs, but by receiving thoughts and beliefs too, man, and that's where intimacy really starts to jive is intimacy is not a one-way road no it, it is uh, you can't you cannot achieve intimacy without it being a two-way street right amen and so i would almost say to step three if we say you have to understand intimacy two you start to identify who you want to build those deeper relationships with well that person's got to be receptive to that no matter how good of a drill bit you got or if you're trying to go deep into in, into a relationship if they're so guarded that you're not going to get through, you're, you're never going to hit that. You're never going to be fill them and they're never going to fill you back. And so part of that is, is yes, you can help people become more receptive, but I don't think we are ever, you're ever going to reach that level of intimacy that you desire with that person if they're not open to that same level of intimacy. Oh, God, yeah. And, and one of the biggest hangups that I've now discovered is judgment, right? And for the entire year and a half, first year and a half of, of our relationship, we discussed judgment and, and how do you judge someone morally? How do you judge someone's belief systems? How do you judge uh, their tone? How do you? So we live in these uh, part of that defensive mechanism, our, our, our off offensive skill sets, right? It is our ability to judge. We, we, you know, we judge from afar, we judge from up close. We, we judge on, on, of casual acquaintances and we judge in the deepest relationships. That's what we do. It's how we evaluate and assess and decide whether we're going to build this relationship or take it deeper, whatever it might be. And so judging and really looking how we judge, right? That's a big part of this and why we judge. What are we judging? Are we judging uh, against uh, our interpretation of the world or are we, are we judging against uh, what we might be a lot of times our own insecurities, right? And so once we have that judgment going, does it get in the way of these deeper connections? And I, and I love that term you use when we first start talking connections because connections, right? It's the free flow of, of, of all things. It's the, the vascularity of a relationship, right? It's, it's how we permeate across those barriers that intensifies those connections. All right. So how do we begin doing that? And a big part is, is, is our judgment system. Is our judgment the way it needs to be? Or is our judgment a little bit uh, uh, abrasive in terms of hyper-protecting ourselves? Yeah, no, I, I love that. It's, it's interesting. You know, I, I grew up in a very loving, great family. We got along, but it was interesting. Sunday dinners at my house were uh, very judgy, right? It was all yeah. like, we believe this way. And anyone that thinks differently is wrong. 
right? Yeah. But it was all based on our our perception in that moment. But it, in some weird way, it brought us together where it was like Sunday dinner. This is what we do. But as I got older, it was like, well, how, how much of my beliefs are based on perception and environment and education? And how much of my beliefs are actually built in fact? And, and it was, that was a defining moment for me to be like, hey, this is going to be, I can choose moving forward. And I got to have a be- better filter for that judgment for myself and for others of, is this, a, is this truth for me based on fact that I can take to the bank? Or is there some element of perception that could be changed with new knowledge? Yeah, I, you know, one of the things that I think so often and what we're seeing a lot of people struggle with is this concept of moral relativism, right? What, what, uh, it's my truth, so it's true. And, and, you know, unfortunately, that's just not the case. You, 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 we would all love that to be the truth, but it just doesn't work that way. However, many million, millions of years of, of our evolution and however many, you know, tens of thousands of years of our societal development and civilization, man, there is a construct of, of natural law that is in place. And if you go against these, these definitive characteristics of organized uh, societies, tribes, cultures, clans, whatever you want to say, you start to see the immediate breakdown of these things. One of the, one of the greatest catastrophes of, of, of human history was not just uh, World War II, but the entire 20th century. You had large groups and masses of people that fell prey to these tyrannical, uh, ideological uh, psychopaths uh, that then they went along because they didn't want to be judged. They didn't want to stand up. They didn't want to think critically for themselves. And unfortunately, I think, you know, a lot of that is beginning to kind of become chic at the moment right now, right? The judginess of our society. Yes. And it's like, all right, how do we get back to these facts? How do we get back to the things that are really rooted in, a, in the intimacy of a relationship, right? And, and I think you always have this default uh, starting point, truth. And if you can make some sense of your of of a truth uh, that you believe, but it's it's as it re- is reflected against the people that care most about you, they're going to tell you, no, you're actually pretty jacked up right now. <laughs> oh, what the hell with you? You don't know what. <laughs> You don't want to hear the truth because it's yeah. it's your truth. And it doesn't mean it's the truth. It just means it's your truth. So, you know, I, I think we, we need to move into that greater space of, of yeah, and it, it would be judgment to accept the judgment of others, right? And to be yeah. open to that judgment. The, there could be two or three people that say the exact same thing to me. And depending on the level of my relationship with them, for instance, if my wife tells me something, and because we have this great relationship, I'm going to be like, whoa, let's slow down for a minute. Tell me more about that. Where if it's someone I don't have a deep relationship with, what do you know? Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah, where, yeah. Where, where I think that's the one of the important pieces of this intimate relationship to self, with deity, with others, is it actually opens you up to progress as a human being. Because now you have somebody that gives you this, gives you this new introspect or perception of you that you can't see internally. Oh, but you're I- open to that judgment. I mean, from day one, right? From Socrates on, and and really, we've only truly been evaluating the self, if you will, right? Consciousness as we know it for the past five hundred years, and 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 you know, when you break it down into terms of know thyself, uh, what where do you start? For me, and uh, what's been the uh, probably the most, and and mind you, in college, man, I I you know I was an art major with a minor in poetry, and I always joke around. I say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a hippie who can kill you, right? <laughs> and and so so you know, I I read all philosophy. I read it, you know, I took theology. I did it all, man, to try and explore what what I what were my belief systems because I didn't come from a religious family I never went to church I never did anything my religion was football man that's all I cared (laughs) about right and and so you know now I move into this position and and how do I know myself right and 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 the, the first rule is love God above all else because through God we can experience all that is great and all that is great is is being alive right and what is what does being alive truly alive mean to people what is the intimacy of your connection to to nature what is the intimacy to your connection to uh, your job right what is the intimacy that you feel within uh, I, I don't know your how you s- express yourself right 
you know, that was kind of the conduit which started down the pathway to know that for me to begin to know myself. You know, I was so afraid to really get to the truth. What happens when you get to the bottom of it and you don't like what you find? You know, what compounds that, I believe, is because we get into relationships, whether they're um, um, sexual in nature or uh, they're professional or mostly, you know, mostly the, our friendships, right? Our fellows, the, the, the fellowship we seek. You know, what happens when we don't hear uh, the responsibility? responses that we're looking for. What do we do? We cut them out and we go on and we find, we surround ourselves with oftentimes with people that are telling us what we want to hear, but it's the real relationships where you're, you're, you're able to allow an interpretation of thyself from your perspective that you're going to say, no, David, I'm not seeing that. This is what I'm seeing it. Do you realize this? Ah, the hell with you, Marcus. What do you know? <laughs> and, then, and that's it, right? Yeah. If, if I was going to look at the, what that next step was, and this, and this actually became really apparent to me this last weekend, um, my wife and I snuck away for a minute to celebrate our 19th wedding oh, anniversary, God which is, which is you, awesome. We, we, we had such a great time. But I would say if, if I was going to add a step four onto our conversation, and this, this came apparent to me as I spent several days straight with her and the conversation never ended was the idea of that intimacy is not a destination. It's <laughs> ongoing, right? The, the, and I think this is for me. And I think for a lot of the people that are, that are uh, part of the whole enchilada nation is we are goal setters and goal achievers, right? It, we want to set goals of, I know when I've won this and I'm going to put it aside and go set the next goal. Yep. And so we tend to lean towards things that we can accomplish, that we can mm -hmm. win, that we know the end, the end line. And one of the things that came apparent to me was, and, and, and when I talk about my wife and I having an incredible relationship now, that's not always been the case. We have had a rocky, rocky times in our relationships. And even as painful as sometimes those, those rocky parts were, I feel closer to her today than I've ever felt because we worked through some of these issues okay. and problems and and not only between us, but with our kids and life and uh, moving states, starting different careers, all those things that felt like friction in the moment because we leaned into that relationship actually created us stronger. And so that was a big aha for me was like, hey, there is no end game to this. No. The, the deepest, intimate, close relationship that I could imagine now as I progress towards that, I'm going to see a new vision for that, what that relationship Amen. could be. What are we, what are we, I mean, when anybody that's motivated, right? Anybody that's goal oriented as, 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 as we all like to be, we become target fixated yeah. and, and that's what we want until we hit that, that target. And then we move to the next one and then the next target, but target fixation, what does that do? It, it creates blinders, right? You, you, it's like, you're looking through the optic your whole life. You're just staring at the crosshairs on that point when there's a whole other world going on around you, right? So intimacy is, is, is a component of, of the entire experience, right? It, the intimacy that you feel uh, with that weapon system is a derivative of a greater, deeper meaning of what you want to be in your life, right? Uh, I want to be a Navy SEAL sniper, all right? Well, that's a pretty intimate description of what you want to do. Are you willing to go through the totality of that? And, and so, you know, our, our society has, has completely... And, and in a good way, I, I no way, shape or form demean this because, you know, in all my performance coaching, you know, it's it's the mastery of a skill set, right? It's it's what are you willing to sacrifice to master a particular skill set because you have to pull all that stuff away. So then it becomes back to the hierarchies, right? All right. What am I going to tear? How am I going to tear this? Because something has to have kind of the pinnacle essence of, of your, your, your focus in your life. Is, is it, is it monetary? Is it materialism? Is it, is it your belief system? And if so, what do you believe in most? And, and, and Harvard did a study. It was the longest study of a kind. It lasts about, I think like a little over 75 years. And they followed a graduating class uh, of uh, Harvard men's class. I think it was like 1936. And then they also got a, a large group of inner city Bostonian poor kids and followed them for this 70 plus year period they had four different curators over time. And twice a year, they'd send them questionnaires and, and they get out there 
And it was whether how successful, how much failure, the deaths, the successes, the alcoholism, the tragedy, the trauma. And these people stayed invested in this. And then their spouses and then their kids got. So it was this massive group of data that they compose over this long arc of, of life. And ultimately what they came out was the number one most thing that all these people said at, at the twilight of their, their life on this earth was that they wished they had invested more in relationships. So what is the ultimate target? Target for us, right? What is the ultimate target? And for me, the ultimate target is is eternity with God, right? That is the ultimate target. In order for me to be able to get there, I gotta live a, a, a morally sound life, right? I have to uh, obey the commandments that that allow me to. Uh, uh, live a Christ-like life. I, I like to say I'll never live that, but because uh, I'm a man and I'm a sinner and I'm all these other things, and God knows I've got a lot to repent about, and they might not let me in when I get there. But what I do know now is that it's the relationships, and really the big part of the accuracy for men, where I finally started to dial in my optics. I'll never forget it was it was right around. I, I was getting ready to deploy for the agency. My child, uh, was, my first child was about ready to be born. Um, I was getting ready to deploy. And so I said, I do not want my child. If I die over this time, I don't want my child being born. And I, I had been saved, right? And it, it wasn't so much about the, the process or the experience of save, being saved. It was the recognition that what, what Christ asked me to do throughout my life is just to spread the good news, right? That's my mission. That's my target. It's to spread the news of love, that God loves you. And if, and if you love others as you love yourself, then you will live a better life. That's it. That's pure and simple. So how do I start doing that? Well, I got to be a better friend to people. Not, not my, I got to teach my friends how to be better people. I've got to be a better friend to these other, these people that are my, I've got to be a better son. I've got to be a better father. So I'm, I'm cleaning up myself. I'm becoming more accurate with my own understanding of who I am. So I can deliver a more honest and sincere and trustworthy component of myself, a better identity. So then those people can make the decision on their end. I believe this guy. I believe that he loves me and I'm going to reciprocate and I'm going to start working on myself. And that's how those relationships really kind of take off. I believe. Oh, that, I think that's so beautifully said, uh, you know, uh, several years ago, someone taught me that almost all of our actions have long lasting results beyond the current, right? And, and the way they described that was in legacy. And so oh, you, it's brilliant. I love that think, word. We think about relationships in the form of legacy. I imagine me going down this journey to say, okay, I want to better relationships uh, in my life. And if I can model that even for 10, 15 people that could say, hey, there's something about the way he builds relationships and they adopt that and then they teach 10 people and, and model that with, you know, just the legacy you can leave. Imagine a world where people approached relationships with this more than, hey, what jeans do you wear? Okay, those fit my, <laughs> those fit my category. We can be friends, right? And, that, and that's really where we start. If you think about junior high, I got kids entering junior high this year. It's, it's this whole new social class of how do we connect, right? Well, and that's, that's the greatest problem. And that's actually, a, you know, it's a nice segue for me. At, you know, when I started Frog Logic, you know, it was after an experience uh, working for Blackwater. I'd gone to Afghanistan and I was mentoring their counter drug commandos. And we had done this raid up in the north and uh, into a town, by the way, that fell to the Taliban recently. And, and, um, and I just want to give a shout out to uh, uh, all the Afghan people out there that are over there and struggling and, and going through uh, what you're going through. I, I, I wish you all the best. God bless you all. You know, stay safe. And man, they're, they're in for a, a real challenge in time right now, unfortunately. And um, so in this experience is, you know, you go in this compound and you go in these compounds and these people have nothing. I mean, they're at the bottom of the barrel. I mean, literally they're living in, you know, the the, the 16th century, essentially in tribalism and an eye for eye type of uh, belief systems. And, and you know, you see these 35 kids in a compound and they have nothing, right? They don't have shoes their clothes are tattered. They have no education. Uh, many of the, the girls will be, and I just saw an article today that the Taliban are going from town to town and they're butchering everybody and they're taking young girls as up as young as 12 and turning them into sex slaves for their campaign, just wow. like uh, Genghis Khan did. And, you know, you see these kids, these young girls and essentially by 13, they're just receptacles for procreation. Little boys are molested and 
being treated horribly. They're whipped. Their women are beaten. They're stoned to death, beheaded. I mean, this is really a, a tragic thing. And so it was in that experience that I was like, man, you can only use the barrel of a gun for so much. Right? It's a necessity. Don't get me wrong. I will never, I will never not recognize that war is is a is an intimate component of uh, regulating uh, the malevolence that's uh, uh, integrated or ingrained into the DNA of the human condition. Uh, but also, I do recognize in the long run, the greatest thing you can do is is generate relationships with people and invest in and in teaching them. Uh, these ideas of intimacy, these ideas of sharing. And so that was really what catapulted me into developing frog logic, right? It was, uh, you know, and, and I was going to try and work with NGOs and nonprofits that like Doctors Without Borders, but special operations and NGOs didn't really kind of see eye to eye. So that didn't work, but that led me to come home and, and start researching kids in America. And it was all about kids. And, and I realized that, you know, my target audience was that middle school age children. And what you have is you have them coming out of the womb of intimacy, right? The protection of, of uh, that paternal and maternal spirit, right? And then they're going out and they're stepping into these areas where now they're having to cultivate their own construct of intimacy with these new birth, uh, 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 blooming relationships, whether it's your first kiss, first date, or it's even more so who's going to be friends with you and why. And, and one of the crazy things that I, you know, found, I found an article written by two guys at Harvard that talked about a concept called uh, internet withdrawal syndrome. And it was the, the fear that the advent of our connectivity through the, the net was going to tear us apart. It was going to tear down our ability to build healthy social relationships and look at what's happened. Hell, all you got to do is watch, uh, what was that documentary on, oh, on yeah. Netflix or whatever it was, where they talked about how, uh, the AI has gotten away from them. Uh, um, social dilemma, I think social dilemma, right? Yeah. You, and, and, and like my, my oldest is 13 too. You know, we got her a phone last year. She worked for it and she did real well. She got a phone, but she doesn't have any, any social media. She doesn't have anything. And we, you know, there's strict regulations. We read her text. She knows it. Uh, and then, you know, what we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to discuss all these things. We're trying to work, work through them because, you know, if, when you're texting somebody, think of all the nuances that are lost within those texts and, or, or, you know, all the, the things that are missing from the intimacy of physical relativity, right? When, when we're in f across from somebody, when we're in those rooms together and we're listening to Chris Smith speak, man, there's a, there's a weight in that room that is palpable, right? I mean, you can feel the pulse of everybody in sync on, on, on the bated breath of every one of his words, man, that's intimacy, right? Yeah. Or it opens up the space for intimacy. And so as I digress, I'm sorry to come back to it. No, we're in a time now more than ever we have to become much more invested in the cultivation or the targeting of intimacy in our relationship. In some ways, I'm so grateful for all the wonderful technologies and advancements uh, and the given lifestyle that we have come to love today. And I also think it creates so much noise and speed that sometimes it's hard to slow down because this, this is not a fast process. No, like this, this is, this oh, is a no. slow, ongoing, targeted, targeted, purposeful process. Think about uh, what you just said. 19 years with your wife, man, that's 19 years of intense intimacy day in and day out. The, the regiment of, of managing this insanely complicated thing called life. And, and, and now you throw on top of that family, you throw on top of that, your businesses, you throw on top of that, uh, your extended families and her family and her siblings and her, all the tragedies are in all her friendships and your friend now, man, all that stuff, it doubles in essence, right? Relationships exponentially magnify the amount <laughs> of pressure that we're on. That's why yeah. so many people who are, are by nature kind of introverted, uh, they don't want a lot of relationships. And, and I always crack up when people say, you, you know, all you need is if you have three or two or three good friends in your life, you're good to go. And I said, <laughs> hell no, that's not enough, man. Yeah. 
It's yeah. your, it's, it, and that's where it comes into play. People's lack of willingness to expose themselves because what happens often when we do say, oh, I think this is a good opportunity for a, a relationship that has some intimacy potential to it. You make the investment and then you get, you get quashed, right? Or you get smashed or they let you down because we're fallible. We're, we're sinners, right? Yeah. And then you're like, oh, I'm not doing that again. So screw everybody. <laughs> uh, it's only in here is where I, that's yeah. that's a way to do it. I, I don't recommend it if, if you really want to have a meaningful life. But yeah, no, I, I agree with you. When you talk about a meaningful life, I, it's a challenge to have a meaningful life without meaningful relationships. In Amen. fact, I would almost I would almost say those are this the same term in some ways of, of the most important things in my world. You can get rid of my assets, you can get rid of my businesses, but in, in the end, it's the relationships that are most important to me. And going back to that idea of that um, being so fixated on the target, looking back over my career, even some of the things I'm most proud of career-wise, I achieved in a moment when I had blinders on that I didn't even realize I was damaging really important relationships in my world. And I'm, I'm grateful that this has become clearer to me now at a, as a 41-year-old man. <laughs> Yeah, I wish it would have been more clear to me younger. I would have approached some things very, very differently, but I'm, I'm proud that I'm recognizing this now and not in my sixties or even worse on my deathbed. Cause there's, there's time for me to repair and build and focus on relationships moving forward. God bless you for that recognition, man. That's the awakening, right? What you just described is the awakening. It's the most critical awakening that we can experience within the human condition. And what's kind of counterintuitive about it is, uh, you know, as we are successful, as we are gaining traction in, uh, in the interpretation of our relevance, right? Because that's what we do, right? We, we try and interpret whether or not we're relevant in the world, whether, you know, we're relevant in our circles, whether, you know what I mean? And we're constantly saying, all right, what have they done? I mean, in the teams, it's insane, man, you know? And we talked about it while we were there, right? We all felt so humbled to be in each other's presence. And it's yeah, cool. like, and, and it's for different reasons and it's different things. And, and yet it took us a long time when I was in the teams, it was all uh, indicative of who had the most combat deployments, who, who's killed the most guys, you know, all this, <laughs> all this stuff, when you, when you reflect upon it, you're like, my God, that's how you measure your peer group. And I, yeah, that's how you do it. And, and you're like, okay, I don't know if that's really healthy, but okay. <laughs> but, but I had to get through that, that I had to move through um, the intensity of, of that, those lessons to get to the lesson where it made me realize the other. And like you said, and what I often try and do, I, I try and mentor young men uh, three or four at a time every year at some component. And, and, you know, I've mentored some men into the SEAL teams and in and young through athletics and other stuff. But, you know, the idea is not to have them accomplish one subset of skills or, 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 or identity badges, if you will, but more importantly, to get them as rapidly as possible to the recognition like you and I are facing at 49 and 40, 42 <laughs> years old, right? Is, is like, oh man, why didn't I start doing this at 27 and 28? Um, because if you do and you can cultivate those healthy relationships, man, your life has more meaning. And, and the truth is, I can't go back in time and change it. But yeah. I, I, the thing I love about this platform is I, I can't go back to my 20s, but can I connect with someone in their 20s or wherever they're at, 20s, 30s, in the now, and help somebody else have that same awakening, that same thought process now in the moment they're at that, that uh, I'm going through now. And, and I owe some of that to you. So thank you again for, uh, for so connecting welcome. with me at that event. And, and I do want to kind of wrap up our conversation here. I'm going to just kind of breeze through my notes here and say okay. some things that I'd like to turn it over to you for a quick, whatever you want to wrap up with, how people find you, any closing thoughts there. But as I was making notes on our conversation here uh, of, of how to approach this, what do we take away and uh, implement is Number one is I want to encourage our listeners to, to take a moment, journal out, define what intimacy is to you, exactly. understand it better. Number two is then go into who deserves that intimacy from you. Start categorizing that and determine the who and how deep do you want that intimacy to go with those specific individuals? Number three is as oh, you Can start, I add oh, one little part please, to that? Please do. It, it, and, and think about the intimacy of accepting other people's int intimacy into your life. Yeah, and that and that's number three for me. There is yeah. is are they receptive to it, and are they are they engaging back? Right, 
Because I think it can be emotionally draining. You look at a lot of relationships that actually are failing because one person is trying so hard and giving everything into it, but the other person is just so not receptive to it that it actually drains that person out. And it goes back to that idea of that this intimacy is a two-way street. It's got to be giving and receiving for it to really reach that level. Uh, number four is now nurture it. There is no destination. Make it a journey. Nurture it along. And the last piece that we talk about there is what do you, as you start perfecting this or getting better at it, what are you doing from a legacy standpoint to teach other people how to elevate their relationships? Even if you're not that person for them for a deep, intimate relationship, but helping them awaken to the idea of they, they, there are people in their world that deserve and need an intimate relationship and giving them the path to do it. From our conversation, do you feel like that, that is a good pathway or summary of what we talked about? Did I miss anything? No, I think you're spot on, Marcus, as you typically are, which is is awesome. You're you're able to to evaluate the context, right? The real context of of exchanges, and and then help help um, uh, formulate a process, like you said, and you do that exceptionally. Uh, I think that's a wonderful place. I, the one last kind of thing I will kind of add with the whole uh, context of intimacy is that right? Intimacy is not necessarily uh, uh, um, imbued with with the positive aspects of relationships. We need to feel the pain too, right? Our our heart breaks. Uh, we have to be able to evaluate those and and not just project uh, the dysfunction on the other person, right? That it's always the other person's fault. Yeah. Uh, many many times we have to uh, look at ourselves in the mirror. Uh, again, going back to where does it start first is the definition of your own intimacy with yourself. Do you really know thyself? Uh, and then, you know, I always offer up if, if it's not going to be God for you or Christ, um, you, you have to step outside yourself, though. You have to be able to evaluate the, the very um, nature of intimacy, which is, is this uh, it, it, it's this exchange, right? It's, it's the back and forth. Um, and, and that really is, is a critical aspect. How are you communicating the intimacy? What are you showing? And for me, everything really changed after I got saved because what I started to recognize is I really started to end every conversation I had always with no matter what, with especially, you know, most, you know, with uh, even, even just um, uh, acquaintances was, was I tell my love them at the end of a, a conversation. And then my closest friends, I'd, I'd tell them I'd love them multiple times through, I, I, I send texts to people now. I end my texts with love you, brother. You know, here are these, you know, the tages of the world, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, you know, what'd you just say to me, bro? You know, and, <laughs> And now Tage says it back to me and, and, and to recognize that, you know, Hey, uh, the, the root of, of intimacy is, is about the aspiration of love and that connectivity and the truth and the trust and the truth that exists within that love. And so, you know, don't be afraid to, to verbalize that, right? Don't be afraid to open up that space. It, it does not make you weak. It does not make you vulnerable. Uh, you are not exposing your belly or your jaw or your neck or whatever you, you know, however you think about it in terms of, of that exposure, it's really about just, Hey, putting it out there for those people who might be struggling themselves to do what they want with it. And, and I've had many, many friends now, uh, you know, the last time I talked to them, I, I was able to tell them I love you before they killed themselves or before they died or whatever it was that really has changed my perspective is that, is something as simple as the as uttering those the, God's words is hey I love you um, that can have a profound impact on the progression the intensity uh, and the profound nature of intimacy within each of us. And I, I love that. Well said. I, I, I imagine a world where more people are open to to sharing that that type of uh, sentiment with more people. Right? We Pretty need incredible. it. We need it. We need it desperately right now, man. Yeah. We really do. Yeah, we do. Well, as we wrap up our conversation about relationships, I just want to thank you for this new blessed relationship in my life. I'm sure grateful for you. 
look up to you. I think you're an incredible man. Um, just appreciate your, your willingness to do this with me in the, in the thought process. So thank you for, for sharing some of your time and, and, and heart with me. I want to encourage all of our listeners here, go check out Frog Logic uh, if you want to hear more of David and, and his sentiment, which I imagine a lot of you got a value out of this conversation. So thank you everyone for listening, joining us today. Take those relationships to the next level and don't forget, go live life on your terms. Thanks again, David. Thank you, brother. God bless you. Love you, buddy. Love you too.